Foucault's Pendulum. Is it the thinking man's Da Vinci Code? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are a bunch of practical jokers who meet somewhere and decide to have a contest. They invent a character, agree on a few basic facts, and then each one's free to take it and run with it. At the end, they'll see who's done the best job. The four stories are picked up by some friends who act as critics. Matthew is fairly realistic, but insists on that messiah business too much. Mark isn't bad, just a little sloppy. Luke is elegant, no denying that. And John takes the philosophy a little too far. Actually though, the books have an appeal, they circulate, and when the four realize what's happening, it's too late. Join us today as we examine the all-consuming nature of obsession and paranoia in Umberto Eco's novel Foucault's Pendulum. I'm your host, Bob. Now please, sit back and enjoy today's edition of Lit Tips. Whether you choose to believe them, give them the benefit of the doubt, or write them off entirely, there is no denying that we are living in the most skeptical age in history. The rise of social media has given far-reaching accessibility to ideas and theories that in previous generations never would have been seen by more than a handful of individuals. For better or for worse, the floodgates have been open for anyone, anywhere, to share their own interpretation of what's really going on. Whether it be in regards to government cover-ups, covert military actions, election fraud, unwarranted surveillance, aliens, lizard people, you get the idea. Umberto Eco saw the rise of these armchair experts in the 1980s, and in response he wrote Foucault's Pendulum. The work stands as one of the late 20th century's great satires, and one whose cultural relevance has only steadily increased since its publication. Foucault's Pendulum broadly satires the world of extreme skeptics, but also, more specifically, that of vanity publishers. These are publishing houses to which aspiring writers pay to have their work printed, as opposed to accepting bids as is the case with mainstream publishers. Such organizations by design inherently attract members of fringe communities, including skeptics, types who believe that their manuscripts contain the true story the public has been waiting to hear. The novel's narrator is Casabon, who at the time he is introduced is a graduate student working on a thesis examining the lore of the Knights Templar. In the course of his research, he meets Jacopo Belbo, an editor, who soon introduces him to his associate, Diota Levi. The three become fast friends based on their mutual interests in history and, more importantly, their shared understanding of the innate ridiculousness of many historical theories. For example, Casabon studies the Knights Templar from a perspective of cultural and historical interest, and not as a means of uncovering them as the puppet masters pulling the strings behind some of history's key events. The same can't be said of characters like Colonel Ardenti, who submits a manuscript to Belbo's publishing house. Ardenti believes that he has cracked an ancient code that lays out the Knights Templar's dubious plans to exact full control over all civilization. Furthermore, he reveals that the Knights are also the protectors of the famed Holy Grail, which in actuality is a source of radioactive energy. Belbo's employer, Mr. Garamond, hires Casabon and Diota Levy to help Belbo establish a series of occult works that will attract more writers to the vanity press. The three tirelessly research every source they can find that deals with obscure plots, noting down endless speculations and hypotheses that draw all manner of flimsy lines and parallels between historic events. Their research, along with the manuscripts of Ardenti and his peers, whom Casabon and the others dubbed the Diabolicals, eventually inspired them to invent a plot of their own concurrently. They set out to create the ultimate secret society plot, one that will outclass and outcrazy any competing theories. Just a few examples of the secret societies they draw from in their research are the Freemasons, the Gnostics, the Cult of Cthulhu, the Jesuits, the Rosicrucians, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The latter are cited by a character who explains, I read about them in a detective story too, but they may not exist anymore. The plan, as they come to call it, grows and morphs into a complex web of falsehoods spanning centuries and continents, explaining that the Knights Templar possess knowledge of how to control the Earth's telluric currents, which in turn gives them the ability to alter the planet's weather. Casabon and the others quickly become so caught up in their game that they fail to realize the effect it is having on their own psyches. They increasingly use the plan less as an amusement than as an escape from their own personal troubles. Belbo experiences this more strongly than the other two, becoming completely consumed by the project. Like the apostles referenced in the opening quote of this video, by the time they've all realized that they've gotten in over their heads, they've already lost any control that they may have had over the monster that they have created. Echo gives Castlebond an opportunity for an out well before his game goes completely off the rails. At a crucial point in the novel, Casabon's girlfriend, Leah, reviews the manuscript for the plan and immediately realizes how deep into the game Casabon has fallen. She recognizes, as he apparently does not himself, 
that by immersing himself deeper and deeper into the world of speculation and heresy, that at some point Casaban has lost sight of the project, that he has strayed away from the satirical nature of the plan's initial design, and gotten dangerously close to joining the ranks of the skeptics whom he set out to mock and ridicule. She says to him, You live on the surface. You sometimes seem profound, but it's only because you piece a lot of surfaces together to create the impression of depth, solidity. That solidity would collapse if you try to stand it up. Casaubon for a brief period steps back from the plan, but when Diotto Levi falls ill, blaming the malady on the group's discovery of knowledge best left unknown, he finds himself dragged right back into it. Things spiral further out of control after they send their manuscript to a wealthy associate named Agli. Agli is a man deeply immersed in the study of the occult, and there is no theory to which he doesn't believe there is at least some credence. It is heavily implied that he is involved in a group that knows considerably more about how the world runs, but the exact nature of the group is left unclear. Agli isn't informed of the satirical nature of the document, as Casabon and the others want to hear his thoughts on it before letting him in on the joke. They are shocked by his response, and his further demands to reveal what else they have been hiding. Casabon, Belbo, and Dio Levi now find themselves plagued by paranoia that they are being watched and followed everywhere they go. The game is over, and their paranoia is now justified. Agli and his aristocratic associates don't know or care how this group of publishers found the truth they've sought for so long. They only care about getting it from them and then ensuring they don't breathe a word to anyone else. Foucault's Pendulum raises questions about hidden plots that most thematically similar works don't go anywhere near. It is less concerned about any specific plots themselves than the allure of hidden plots. Echo posits that these theories exist as a way of explaining mysterious phenomena in an outlandish way as a coping mechanism for an individual's inability to understand them due to lack of intelligence or otherwise. For instance, it's much easier to write off, say, a coup in some far-flung country as just another chess move made by the shadowy, all-powerful cabal of figures who control the world from smoke-filled rooms, rather than putting in the time to research and familiarize oneself with the infinitely complex geopolitical factors that would lead to such an event in the first place. With this in mind, it becomes clear that the underlying themes Echo wishes to stress in Foucault's pendulum are obsession and paranoia. A comparable work, one that might not appear as such upon first glance, is David Fincher's 2007 film, Zodiac. On the surface, and indeed for the bulk of its first half, the film plays as a period piece recreating the unsettling spree of killings in the 1960s and 70s. As the film progresses, it takes an interesting turn that sets it apart from other works in the serial killer subgenre. The murders stop, the police come to one dead end after another, and gradually both the killings and the public's fear of the Zodiac killer fades into a distant memory. The protagonist, cartoonist Robert Graysmith, finds himself increasingly isolated from his peers as he cannot bring himself to let the case go. At the height of the murders, everyone was just as obsessed as he was, and he was commended for his ability to draw believable conclusions between the killings. But as time passes and the Zodiac is replaced in the media frenzy by the new issues of the day, Graysmith can't bring himself to move on. He devotes his life to identifying the killer, to the severe detriment of both his professional and personal lives. Like Casabon, Graysmith puts himself in serious danger by refusing to leave well enough alone. There comes a point where he has to ask himself, is this worth it? He has no personal stake in the project, he isn't working to solve the death of a loved one, and while his pursuit does have a noble aspect to it, the film underlines over and over the seeming futility of his entire project. To paraphrase hardcore history host Dan Carlin, the best way to discredit anyone looking to expose an actual plot is to plant false leads that will be latched onto by clearly unstable people. The argument for whether or not certain events in our world are the product of actual machinations or not is beyond the scope of this video. The main point to derive from Carlin here is that it is enough for people to simply believe in misinformation for it to become retroactively real in their minds. In the novel, Ardenti and his fellow writers, as well as Agli and his associates, represent exactly these kind of individuals. Despite coming from vastly different social backgrounds, they share a common desire to believe what they've read about, exhaustively researched, and develop their entire personas around is real, and not just a compendium of lies and misinterpretations. They refuse to consider they may have been had by a centuries-old prank, a proto-version of The Plan. Foucault's Pendulum has been dubbed by some fans as The Thinking Man's Da Vinci Code. Question about this directly. Echo sidestepped commenting on this distinction and instead offered his musings on Dan Brown's book. I was obliged to read the Da Vinci Code because everybody was asking me about it. My answer is that Dan Brown is one of the characters in my novel Foucault's Pendulum, which is about people who start believing in occult stuff. 
In Foucault's Pendulum, I wrote the grotesque representation of these kind of people. I invented him. He shares my character's fascinations. The world plot of Rosicrucians, Masons, and Jesuits. The role of the Knights Templar. The Hermetic Secret. The principle that everything is connected. I suspect Dan Brown might not even exist. We hope that you enjoyed this edition of Lit Tips. As always, hit that like button if you like what we're doing, subscribe for more videos on literature from your favorites to the plain obscure, hit that bell if you want to be notified when videos drop, and leave a comment with your thoughts on this video along with suggestions for any books or authors you would like us to cover in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.